to the Mobops podcast. Today we have an amazing guest, Frank Hussman. He's a B2B and SAS marketing expert. I know what you're thinking, the guy we need right now. SAS serial founder with over 20 years of experience in B2B marketing and sales. Welcome, Frank. Hello, how are you doing? Thank you so much for having me. I'm doing great. Hope you're doing good yourself. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. I'm, I'm doing good. I, I will ask a lot of questions. I will pretend like it's for my friend, but actually it's for myself. So uh, you okay. have like 20 years of experience in the field. I have like about seven, eight years of experience and I'm exhausted already. So let's get to the <laughs> questions. Given your ex extensive, extensive experience in B2B and SaaS marketing space, can you share some unique insights of how the lead generation landscape has evolved over, the, over this time? Because it feels like it's changing like every month, every year, but but in a landscape of 20 years, it's probably like a huge chance, uh, changes like going on. What are some of the most significant shifts you ever observed and how this change in influence, changes influenced your current strategies? So just tell us what's been going on for this last 20 years. Yeah, great question. Yeah, so there's been lots of changes, especially lately with AI coming up, of course. I mean, if I look back in 20 years or so, some of the things will always work. But I think from the last couple of years, some major changes have, has, have happened. And I think one of the last ones have been the AI, the explosion of AI content in general. We're going to talk about that a bit later. But in terms of tactics, I think one of the main things that has been happening a lot, um, I think for the last, I don't know, two years in the past to 10 years in the past, the Marketo, Spardots, and, and Salesforce as well, they all, they went full on white paper lead generation, create as much white papers, create as many emails as possible and send them over to sales. And if you would have 100 of them, you would probably have about three appointments from the 100 email addresses. And that will probably generate one or two sales, maybe one uh, that really worked brilliantly in the past. And uh, especially when LinkedIn came up, of course, as well, you would just create so many campaigns and the sales would be happy. I think that's something that really changed. I think that's probably something that's been going on for two years now. Basically, people are really, really tired of having to put their email you know, to some sort of gate and then get some mediocre content, three blog posts that they call a white paper, right? Or maybe an ebook. And then the follow up is, of course, a LinkedIn message connection, uh, another email sequence. And then if you even had to put in your phone, they were going to ring you up as well. So people are really tired of that. So I think this is one of the major changes that's been going on, basically. And um, yeah, there are, of course, things to um, do that in a different way. And I think that's what we're doing right now in the, in the B2B uh, space. Yes, definitely. I hear these stories a lot. Some of the people like some of the people ask me, look at this lead generation tool, like it gives you a perfect lead for thirty dollars and what's your cost? I'm like, Yeah, no, but try it. Try the quality and things like that. So yeah, I definitely feel you about it. It's, the thing that's interesting is that I mean, uh everyone wants wants the, the, the silver bullet, everyone wants to have the lead now and the sale tomorrow, right? But I mean in B2B, that has never been the case, <laughs> not over 20 years, and still it's not going to happen. So you still have to educate, educate, educate. And I think the whole focus is going to be is really more about quality than quantity. Because in the past, it was really just shoot as many bullets as you possibly can. And it something will stick to the wall, right? And and this this approach, I mean, at the end of the day, you're even burning your own market. You're you're losing prospects because they're they're annoyed by by what you're doing from a marketing uh, point of view. So yeah, I, I think uh, that and the whole AI thing that's going on, because people are like, Oh, now I can create videos. Okay, cool. Let's do a video of my face saying, "Hey, hello, Anton. Yeah. You know, I got this great content for you." And then they blast. And you have to put a mic here and act like it's a podcast too. Like, "Hello, guys." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, just going to be misused again. And uh, yeah, th th these are interesting times. So, if you just peel it all back, it's going to be. Um, I think it's going to be more uh, human to human. And showing your true um, your true knowledge, your true expertise about your market, because at the end of the day, we're selling a B two B service or a B two B software, and it's it's um, it's going to be a solution to a problem, right? So let's focus on the problem that our clients have. Tell them about it. Tell them that you've experienced that a lot and how you've solved it in the past. And if you focus a lot on that part, I mean, at the end of the day, people will get to you and. The fancy word for that right now is demand generation. Definitely. Um, yeah. And I think that's something that we've been doing in the past a lot. So it's not something new, but there's more focus on demand generation and on lead generation. 
Yes, exactly. I remember 2014, 2015, when I was sending like 200 emails a day, and that actually worked. And right now I have to use every AI tool available on the market to have a perfect content strategy. And that leads me to my next question, because not a lot of marketers even know about this, even think about this. And I've been working with this for the last three years. I want to speak about authority uh, marketing. And your company yeah. focuses on helping B2B companies become authorities in their industries. Can you yeah. explain this approach? And because I know that a lot of people don't even think about authority marketing and how it works and how it makes leads generation quality better with every day. Can you explain your approach to authority marketing and why it's so important in the B2B space? Yeah, great question. So yeah, authority question, uh, authority marketing is an answer to the whole problem that we got right now in B2B about not getting enough leads and not delivering the, the promise that we made. Um, and so what's what the idea behind authority marketing is you're going to show your expertise to the market. And by showing your expertise, you will become the authority in your market. And that will draw clients to you. Um, and, and of course, this has been the promise of inbound marketing in the past as well. But it has been misused by creating lots of articles like the top 10 mistakes when selecting a CRM software. You know, these are just all these generic uh, posts with not showing any expertise. But when you turn it around, there are so many people in your company, in, in all our companies that have so much um, knowledge about the problems that our clients are facing. Let's talk to them. Let's do a short interview, 30 minutes, maybe an hour, and you'll have content for a month or so. You will definitely have a blog article, maybe even a podcast. So that's the first circle. There are probably founders, they're probably consultants, implementation specialists, maybe someone from sales who's got a lot of knowledge about what the clients are facing. So that's that's one, one way to do it. And the other thing that we're doing a lot as well is just um, looking at who are the experts currently in the industry and just interview them. Because most of the time they'll have a really large network. I'm sorry, this is what I'm doing don't... right now. Just, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you already know it works, right? Breaking up. So yeah, podcast is one way, of course. Um, but the thing with um, so just rewind a little bit. Um, so you have expertise in your own uh, organization. You can use that and make sure that you just interview people in your organization. Just block one hour of their time or thirty minutes. And you will, you, there are so many tools that you can transcribe, create videos from podcasts, whatever, and articles. I mean, that that's really not that hard to do, to be honest. And this, but you have to schedule time, of course, for it, and and, and a calendar. It's work, of course, but th that's a great way to do it. The other part is um, interviewing people in in the in the industry, and that can be possible prospects, but it can also be a freelance who got a great network, or maybe agencies that are that are a bit adjacent to what you're doing. And when you do that, the thing is that if you put that content out, people will be really, really uh, interested in your company and they have a bigger audience as well. So it will get expanded as well. And um, I think these are the two things that many people really don't do, to be honest. When I see, I think eight out of 10 B2B companies, they really don't do that. And I think in the software space, they're slowly trying to do it, but they're so focused on the software most of the time when the founding team is really technical and they really don't want to get out. They're just going marketing, just ads, 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 and sales, making phone calls all day. I mean, yeah, I mean, why don't show it? Why don't you show your expertise? That's always my, my, my yes. question, but it's probably not in yeah. the DNA. I don't know. I'm, I'm agree with you so much. I see so many companies who just say, oh, okay, let's make a couple of ads and just run a perfect lead generation campaign and just get like a thousand partners with that. And when you try to explain this now, how this works right now, this has been probably working like 10 years ago, but thank you for sharing yeah. this insights. Now you just described, yeah. <laughs> you just described my strategy for the last three years. I hope my boss hears this. I was right. <laughs> I have another expert who thinks like the same things that I do. So yeah, thank you for telling me that I'll not get fired. So uh, this leads us to my next topic. Actually, it's a perfect segue about, about the content that back in the days, as I just said, we sent like a couple of hundreds of emails a day and that just done the job. Now we have to create content. Now we have to be to show our expertise. And so I want to just talk about the role of the content in B2B lead generation. How do you balance the need for providing valuable, engaging content with the goal of driving leads? Like this is like, Everyday's task for me, everyday's challenge for me. Like I need to 
create a creative content, but at the same time, it should be lead generation oriented. So, and yeah. I have to balance it somehow. So I hope you will share some successful content strategies. How do you balance this thing? Because right. it has to be interesting on one side, but at the same yeah. time, it has to drive a lead. It has a, to, to have a perfect CTA. We can't just do a segue in the end, contact us. No, you can have somehow yeah. to, Keep this in your mind that you will drive leads with this contest. So could you share any sure. strategies or any secrets? I, I will write it down. <laughs> yeah, sure. So content is the basis of any B2B marketeer. So, I mean, we can talk all day about whatever kind of campaign we'd like to do or ads, whatever, but we need content basically. And we need content for the whole funnel. And and so that's that's the first thing that we really need to do. We we need to know that there are people that don't know they have a problem. There are people that they know they have a problem and they need some sort of solution that we can provide. And then there are people that are looking for the specific solution that we provide and they are going probably going to uh, check out some companies that do more or less the same. So these are the, the simple ways of the, the three parts in the funnel of people just thinking about how they can solve their problem. Um, so when they're not problem aware, we need lots of content about that, right? Um, and, but every piece of content we create will always need a call to action to the next step in the whole funnel. And um, so that's, that's I think, the second thing that we need. And the third thing that we need is that what will be the main channel that we're going to use? And at, at first, we don't really know, right? It's always depends on what stage the company is in. Um, I see um, uh, software companies that are self-funded. I see software companies that have raised a lot of money. And I see companies that have been around for 10 plus years. And they have so much content already. So these are so it already depends on what stage you're in uh, as from a maturity perspective of the company as well. So one of the biggest drivers is still SEO traffic, traffic from Google, right? So if you're starting from zero, you definitely need some, I, I call it hygiene content. Uh, what does that mean? People will search for the, the, the versus pages if they compare you to another piece of software. Always start with that, with the, with the bottom. Then you work your way up. And at, at the at the bottom part, you will probably definitely need to have top 10 mistakes when implementing whatever software. But but don't create the same content that, that's already available. But use some quotes from the people that have used your software, that are your, your people that create the software, right? The things that I've seen as challenges. So, I mean, that's the, the, the hygiene content. You, you really need to have that part. Then uh, when you're going to run some campaigns, probably on LinkedIn, because we're B2B marketers, right? Um, you will need uh, other content as well. For example, uh, it's all about trust on LinkedIn. You can't just push anyone to book a demo, start a trial or whatever. You know, Th that's not what they're there for. They're there to, to get knowledge. That's why they're on LinkedIn and to connect with other people. So uh, you need to uh, show them that you got the expertise. How can you do that? Talk about the problems that you solve and show cases, for example. Uh, so you need cases as well, or any other way that proves that you know what you're doing. So any company that I work with, I try to create, well, it depends on the on the, on the phase where, they, where they're at, but at least one case uh, a month or every two months until we have like a library of cases. And then you can build way more trust with all the campaigns that you're running, because that will always also be used by email campaigns, nurture campaigns, whatever you got, right? So I know it's a long answer, but it's, uh, it, it it's all depends on what stage you're in as a company, what kind of channels you want to use. And I think that what I covered is that you need to have the basics in order and have every piece of content for the whole funnel. Makes sense, hopefully? Yes, it makes a lot of sense. Basically, all we have, well, let's be honest, all we have, for example, in Europe and North America uh, is like our SEO and LinkedIn and B2B. And we have to make the strategy right. And I'm totally on board with you because I've been working with, in, in my experience, I've been working with a company who had no SEO whatsoever work done before. And I was pushing some content just to put the keywords out there. Like content wasn't that relevant, but I had to like oh. pitch start SEO. And it was, it had a lot of keywords that I, and then we started to produce like more content quality related to the company, just to people to read this. But we needed to show up on the Google, uh, Google right. search and things right. like that. So it's yeah. definitely, uh, I'm, I'm on board with that. I've been through that. So yeah, definitely. Have you yeah. seen a change? Like what's the more, the biggest change through, about the B2B content in the, in the last 10 years? Because I feel like, you know, a while ago, it was more about the articles, more about the cases, more about, uh, I don't know, more about 
uh, educating people in now it's more about media content now it's all about like videos yeah. podcasting things like that is this the change that you're observing as well right yeah i think that's a great point i think the the, the content that we need to create is still content for the whole funnel and maybe in the past we did it with gated white papers or gated cases i really hope no one that's listening is using any gated uh, cases ungate them as soon as possible please uh, but um, the, the the way that we are using it right now is uh, multimedia, basically. And what does it mean? Video, I think, is the most underrated tactic uh, in B2B marketing. I think everyone should have a, a video strategy. And it can be as simple as just what we're doing right now. Record the video and use it as little clips on social media for LinkedIn, embed it in your articles, and, it will, and use it in your newsletter, email marketing, YouTube channel, and it will just really help you be more like a human. I think I men men mentioned that before. We're all humans and we're not, I mean, it's called B2B marketing, business to business. But at the end of the day, I'm talking to a person, I'm doing business with a person. And the main problem, especially with, with software or services, um, with people that you can't shake your hand with because we're not in the same time zone, whatever, or not in the same place, it's all about trust. So how can we deliver trust? Video is amazing for that, right? Um, so yeah, video, audio, but also the whole carousels, like the, the PDFs and stuff like that. It's it's more visual. That's I think that's the, the major change that's been going on for the last uh, 10 years. And the thing is that every trend report you read, video is going to be big. Okay, <laughs> for I have read it for years, right? But still, when I see 10 B2B companies, I don't know what your experience has been, but there's no real video strategy. Yes, some do, but I mean, eight out of 10 don't. Definitely, definitely. And you... you you said it right. We're all humans. We all make mistakes. And I just want to prove everyone that we, we know you have a lot of experience in the field and you know you have a lot of success stories. But just to show how human we are, let's speak about a little bit about mistakes. I've, I'll, I'll give you an example of how I've made a mistake that I've, I've learned a lot from it. So a couple of years ago, I've decided that I'm going to make a new type of content. I was looking for a new type of content. And I've decided to make educational videos for, for people on the page and I invested so much time money in it no one was interested like zero and I've already made a series like three episodes and now we were explaining stuff explaining things and then we figured it out all right probably no one wants to learn from us even though it's still educational but we just not the right type of source for educating people and yeah that was a huge mess up for me and i was like all right i'm not gonna do this i probably underestimated my audience and i will keep going with other types of content maybe you have some type of stories that was a mistake for me just to prove everyone you're human same as all we are <laughs> Oh, man, I got so many mistakes. I mean, we could fill the whole podcast with it. <laughs> but I mean, I don't call them mistakes. I never call them mistakes. I really call them learning experience. Right. It's a lesson, you, right? It's a lesson. If you word it in a different... I mean, I, actually, one of the my mentors, uh, I don't know, I, there was something in, in my company and I was afraid of, I don't know, something going wrong. And he said, whatever happens, we will learn from it. Uh, so, I mean, that that's really a great perspective on on looking at if something goes wrong. And I mean, I got so many of these. For example, uh, we're doing uh, account-based marketing as well. And we create a list of people that we talk to and we create expert content around it and, and, the, and the white paper, a research report, to be honest. We do that a lot. So we interview about six experts in the field, create one uh, research paper and the sales will use it to, um, to, to get to know prospects that they would normally never talk to, right? So it's more of a journalistic uh, approach to expert content. Um, so sales will go and reach out to all those people that, that were interviewed in the report. But I create a list of all the people that we interviewed and the people that we didn't interview. And what did sales do? This blast out an email to everyone. Thank you for helping me with the re with us with the report. And they get feedback. We didn't do it. Why did you call us? And the, the funny part is, at the end of the day, um, the first reaction of some were, were some were not so positive when they talked to the phone because they were chasing them by the phone as well. They were like, oh, the report is really nice. Call us next time you do it as well. And <laughs> that was so interesting. So what I'm trying to say is 
at first you're like, oh, we would made a real big mistake, but every mistake can be turned around. I think well, <laughs> there are some exceptions, of course, <laughs> but uh, we're not going to get into that. Definitely, um, every mistake can be turned around unless you spend a huge budget on it. That's that that would be a problem. So let's speak budgets or fiscal now. Harm. <laughs> let's speak yeah. budgets now. We all we all we all have budgets. That's uh, I, I, I'd, I'd like to say that marketing is always about the budgets. We always have budgets. We have to think about it all the time. So given the yeah, yeah. today's like circumstances but i think about the about the budget thing is um uh you can blast 10k or 100k in a budget but my approach is always just test it with a small budget and small is for every company every phase is different right so i always try to test it with a small budget and then see what works and iterate from that so i mean it would be great if we would have like a carte blanche and go like well there's one million and just go <laughs> But I mean, I don't work that way. Maybe some other people will work that way. But I like I like the fact that online you can test a lot, yeah. right? So with micro budgets, definitely. That's that's what I've been saying this whole time. But the budgets, budgets are well getting cut right now. At least in North America, we have a recession going on, layoffs, things are going worse. You contact a partner, they say, Oh, we will have to cut a budget. I'm sorry. Like everyone's cutting the budget. Even companies that are not affected, they're cutting the budgets just to, well, to not be affected in future. So do, how do you adapt to this? Because I know it's a it's a, it's a hard topic and it's an issue right now in the industry. How do you adapt with your clients, with your partners to lower budgets, but your but the probably expectations will stay the same, right? How do you adapt to this whole situation well i think uh one of the things that that makes me a bit quite agile is that because i've been uh managing my own business being an entrepreneur for such a long time i always look uh at the at the client with that perspective right i mean it's great that we have some budget to test things and experiment and if that's not there then we'll go back to basics and I mean, I have done. I've always done it for my own company, so I, I'm I'm not really a big spender, to be honest. Uh, already from the get go, I think that's what I mentioned with the micro budget. So for me, it's like, okay, so we're going to make some changes. We know what works. We'll iterate on that, and hopefully, we'll have some budget to experiment a little bit, or we can move a little bit around. So I'm, I always try to be creative, to be honest. As as long as no one is getting a sacked or a cut from the team, or, and then still, I mean, we have to do with with, with what works, right? I mean. To be honest, I don't really have that that problem. It, it, of course, it's not great. It, it's definitely not great to hear. Uh, it's back to the drawing board, board uh, to be honest. And uh, I don't have a problem. I mean, 20 years, right? I've, I've seen all the ups and downs. I mean, the dot-com crash, everything. I started my company, I think it was 11 September 2001. And when I was in my car going to sales meetings, I, I was hearing about some uh, towers uh, falling down in New York. That was not fun, of course, but I mean, that started the whole recession. Uh, so I mean, I've seen so many recessions already. So I don't really, I mean, it is what it is. Just uh, make sure that we're doing the right things. Yeah, survival of the fittest. That's usually the thing that is going on. And But, you know, the crisis time usually drives innovations. For example, every type of crisis, we had a COVID and COVID brought us to this Zoom, for example, a rise of Zoom and video calls and remote workers. And, well, we know that crisis drives innovations. Can you share some lead generation strategies that you implemented to, to the current global situation? How have these strategies helped your business, for example? Maybe you came up with, like, I don't know, new ideas during this crisis during this area of recession or you just keep going because obviously you had a lot of things going on for the past 20 years or you just like you feel fine in this era just tell because i'm usually i'm usually i'm always worried about these things i, I don't know about you i hope you maybe you're more stable than i am and everyone is of course worried on some level in their lives of course right but i mean to be honest like i said before i mean the recession is just what it is and it happens sometimes as long as you're training yourself and just know what's going on in the market uh, and you're agile, right? And you don't, and then, then I think you're perfectly fine um, if you got a great brain as well, to be honest. But uh, I think what's interesting is what you mentioned about the things that have been changing in the, uh, over the last few years is that COVID, of course, accelerated the whole um, uh, working from home and doing things like this, right? And I have been, uh, when I had my software as a service company, I already had a distributed company across the world because um, I've been working with people all over the world. So I, I already was quite accustomed to doing it like this. I have been working for international clients a long time before that as well. 
and I would do things like this with Skype back then. And uh, so for me, it's not really a change. I got a remote team as well right now. So to be honest, for me, that that's really always been part of life, uh, even uh, though I had an office uh, where I didn't go a lot to, to be honest. Uh, so that part for me, I think it's great because we can do things like this and we can work with people in different time zones uh, with different talent as well. Uh, that that make, brings a really great, uh, I think, dynamic to what we're doing. The other thing that you mentioned about lead generation, but that's probably more about, about tactics. I think um, what I really like about B2B is that uh, it, we're not Amazon, right? We can more or less define our market. And when you really bring it down and you know how many people you need, I think the whole account-based marketing approach, I think that's uh, an underrated tactic and something that yeah we, sh we should really focus more on as B2B marketeers um, because it can it creates some uh, intimacy with your prospects and also with sales because it, in the past it used to be, give me some leads, right? Where are the leads? <laughs> But now you're working together, and I think that's also a trend that's been going on. And we're even more uh, about the revenue as well. And so we have to work closer to, to with sales as well. So I think that's something that's been going on to create leads. And of course, the number of leads will be a lot smaller, but they're of really high quality. Yeah, so that's the thing. Instead of adapting, just get ready for whatever. And in the end of our episode, we usually ask for advice. We usually ask our experts because we want our audience to stay connected with you, with our guests, because our guests are usually incredible experts. And let's just imagine that we have a person who just starting their way into lead generation, into B2B SAS uh, industry field, who just started out, who just needs some help, maybe a company who needs some lead generation all and B2B services. And let's say, well, it's not me, obviously, everything about me is perfect. My lead generation is so cheap. It's so incredible. But I have a friend who is struggling sometimes. Prices are going up for every lead. And he has to explain this to his boss, why it's going up and things like that. What would you, what advices would you give? What resources? How can you personally help these people with their struggles and with their targets in this life? Just please tell our audience how they can do this. Well, one of the things I personally do is just an audit because I really need to know what's going on. And I can do that from, from a distance, right? I don't need to get the keys to any LinkedIn campaign or a Google Ads campaign, but that's always a start. I will check out what's been going on. And one of the things that with the expert content, for example, I always check is what are they doing on social and what kind of content are they creating? And I can really see very quickly if that's not really expert content when there are no real people, no real quotes, no real cases in the in the in the content or in the in the social posts then I do know that there's a lot to gain because they're just, you know, pushing content for pushing content. Uh, so that's one of the things uh, that I always look for um, when, when when we're going for the expert route. And um, yeah, on on th so that's, that's one of the things that I look for. Uh, but when you really want to do it yourself, right? One of the things that you can do is you can go to maxiality.com and there you can find lots of information about it and the ebook about it as well, how you can do it yourself. But to just boil it down a little bit to the steps is, um, I mean, what you really need to, to think about is, would you like to be the source of chat GPT, large language models that are rolling out right now or not? Uh, because at the end of the day, <laughs> they need to get their content from someplace, right? Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing is that your competitor will be generating lots and lots of content at some point, because I hear that a lot. Maybe you've been hearing that as well, that, oh, well, we have ChatGPT. Let's create 30 articles. Let's create 50 articles. Eh, Probably familiar, right? Amateurs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it will, I mean, in six months or one year from now, what's going to happen? Because I mean, of course, Google is saying it's, it's okay-ish if, as long as you deliver value, but I mean, at the end of the day, people will not really read it and Google will catch up as well. So, I mean, back to the drawing board is again, make sure you know every step of the funnel, map it out and create a content strategy around it and use all the different multimedia uh, that you can use. And, but don't, don't go overboard, right? Just start with one topic do it for three months then the next one and then the next one just baby steps to be honest and then if there's something really working um elaborate on that frank i know i have to say this because i'm a 
this podcast host, but I had a really great time. You actually lifted my spirit. I feel that you have the same struggles that I have. And at the same time, you have the same ideas how to overcome these struggles. And this is why I'm I'm feeling much better right now. I'll be honest with you, because I feel like so, we're sharing the same ideas. And this makes me feel like I'm going the right direction. I hope this works for our audience. This has been Frank Hussman. We'll drop a link below just for you to stay connected with Frank. He's an incredible expert in the field. 20 years of experience. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure I'll survive this long of era because yeah, it's, it's been a lot of ups and downs last seven, eight years. So I'm, I'm already tired, but yeah, I'll keep going. Thank you so much, Frank, for being with us. It's been incredible. Thank you. Well, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. It was really great. Yeah.